Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. We are um, about two-thirds, I guess you could say, through a series where we're looking at his story. God's word from beginning to end, the history of your world, uh, if you would, of the world, of mankind. And just to kind of give you an overview of where we, we've been, we started at the very beginning. In the beginning, there was God, and it was just God. He preexisted all that we uh, knew. But also at the center of the story, though, even though it's God's story, is his beloved. Uh, everything he created, he created specifically for his beloved. And so um, at the end, he created man and woman in his own image, his beloved. And he created them without shame, which means that they were completely good with each other and they were completely good with him. There was nothing, nothing to be ashamed about and uh, nothing to worry about, completely exposed and feeling okay about that. But in the process of making man and woman, in, in, the, in that case, he gave them free will, the ability to love. And, um, and they gave in, if you would, to uh, free will and to their appetites, to their desire, to their pride. And they broke fellowship with God. And the result was shame and blame, remember? It was separation, separation from each other, separation from God. All of a sudden, shame came in for the first time. They began to realize, oh, there's something wrong here. And then, of course, it's somebody else's fault. That's the blame part. And in the midst of this fall, right, even though there's great consequence, there's separation from God, and, and ultimately there's separation from the garden itself, God gives a promise. He promises a Savior that would come. And it's, it's really vague, but it's, it's kind of put out there. And we know that it's gonna, uh, he, the Savior is going to come from a human being. That's all we know. And then the story from there kind of goes uh, up and down, right? Man's rejection, mankind's rejection of the beloved, but yet the beloved's um, faithfulness to mankind. And from the separation, it, it kind of, you know, People further and further go away from God. There's great violence. And um, there's a flood at the end. The God kind of says, I, this is not what I created mankind for. But even in this, we kind of see God's salvation and his faithfulness to pre preserve Noah and his family. And from here, we see God's faithfulness to his beloved as he comes to Abraham. And he just makes a promise that he's going to do. And he says to him, you know, um, I'm going to do some great, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless many generations out of you, but the last part of this blessing is that all nations on earth, not, not just your family, but all nations will be blessed. And knowing that the biggest blessing, the, the whole story is about us being reconciled again to our beloved, um, we begin to look for this Messiah that comes from the family of Abraham because they will be a blessing to all nations. From here, uh, the story kind of goes on and kind of uh, hit bottoms out, if you would, in, in that God's people find themselves as slaves, as uh, Pharaoh and, and Egypt as a whole reject the beloved. They reject God and enslave God's people. But even in this, God is faithful. He delivers them out of that, right? The 12 plagues through the Red Sea to the foot of the mountain. And here, God's faithfulness shows up in giving them the law. This is what it means to be my special people. And also giving them the sacrificial system that blood must be shed so that we are made right with God. They can have a relationship with God even though they continue to fall short. God moves them into the promised land that he said that he would move them in. And it seems the more that he blesses his people, the worse they become. And it just the story goes lower and lower and lower and lower. And the, the very last sentence, I guess you could say, what we call self, is the sentence that in those days, everyone did as they saw fit. It, was, it just came down to the God of me. They did it, you know, my way kind of attitude. But even in this, God is faithful. And he preserves his people. And he rises them uh, up and, and eventually he, he picks a man after his own heart, David. is the second king over all of Israel, and God comes to David and, and, um, and speaks a blessing over him and his kingdom. And he also promises that somewhere down the line, a descendant of King David would rule. But he would not just rule, he would have an eternal kingdom. 
And, and it kind of lets us know, A, now it's not just the entire family of, of Abraham. It's specifically the line of Judah. It's specifically the line of David. And he would be a king. And there's some divine aspect to it because eternity is involved. And we, Israel kind of has its heyday, if you would, in David and the son who follows him, Solomon. But even in their lives, David and Solomon, we see the weakness of humanity. And you got to, if you're reading this story, you got to think at this point, is there anyone ever born in mankind that could really be the Messiah that they really need or are looking for? And from there, we covered this last week, right? The kingdom splits and it just gets uglier and uglier and uglier. And God sends people to say, please stop, please stop, please stop, please stop, please stop. But they continue. And so eventually they find themselves in captivity. And that's kind of where we ended up last uh, week, where they are carried away off into captivity, just as God had said they would if they had not stopped, if they had not repented, if they had not been more faithful to their beloved. But even in the midst of this, in the, in the midst of being carried off, Jeremiah, who's the last prophet, if you would, to Judah, the last remaining uh, kingdom, is warning and warning and warning. But he says this in Jeremiah 29, uh, verses 10, 11. You'll recognize 11, but a lot of times we leave out 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, in other words, he's telling them, Babylon's are the ones who are going to come and carry you away. I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. Now, we are familiar with verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Tom did a wonderful job. You remember he preached on this the last time he, uh, he preached uh, here about, we love this, prosper you, but we forget that this promise was given as they go into captivity. It's not a right now promise. It's not a you can just get it together and all work out promise. But it is, a, it is hope in the midst of a desperate situation. And as we kind of fill in the blanks, I want you to see God's faithfulness in captivity. Even though they're in captivity, even though they're, if you would, at, at a really big low. And one of the reasons this is one of the biggest lows is because they, they just came off the biggest high. David and Solomon, that reign of Israel it was its heyday. And it just kind of went down, 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 down. And now they're at the lowest low. There is no Israel left. No, nothing. There's a few folks left, but they're the poorest of the poor, uneducated, who just basically can work the land and send Nebuchadnezzar his due. Everybody else has been killed or carried off. And so let me kind of fill in the blanks, if you would, between captivity and where we'll find ourselves today that kind of show God's faithfulness. First of all, during this time, the book of Lamentations is written. It's, it's, ba it's basically a collection of dirge poems written to express the anguish and sorrow felt by the Jewish captives. It's filled with poems of suffering. It's filled with confession, but it's also f uh, filled with hope. That's something unique about God's people is that in the midst of when everything's going wrong, when everyone else is freaking out, God's people will freak out a little bit too, but there's still always hope. Another uh, book that was written during this time is, is a, uh, written by a young man named, named Daniel who was taken away along with many of his relatives to Babylon. And he kind of writes about his experience in Babylon. Even in this, we see God's faithfulness. If you grew up at all in the church, you're probably used to hearing stories about Daniel. Daniel, uh, one of the initial stories is, is they're carried off. They were identified as some young man that had some potential, that the king could use their potential. He could use their intelligence, right, to kind of better his kingdom. It's kind of like the way... We normally pick immigrants in this country, right? If you got something to offer that you could bring, then we let you in and we want to use all we can. This is the same thing. But part of their program is when they brought people in, other immigrants, and they trained them up, they put all kinds of food and all kinds of great things on the table. The thing is, is that God's people were told only to eat certain kinds of things, which were, we call it unkosher. They were not kosher. They were not, they were against what God would have them eat. And so Daniel, right, he goes and says, hey, you know what? Uh, I understand you have a job to do, but let us eat the way our God told us to eat for a certain amount of time. And everybody will eat the way 
they ate. And then at the end, if, we, if we're not where we should be, then we'll eat like everybody else. Right? Now, I know, I know there's a popular thing out there about the Daniel diet, right? <laughs> if you go eat like Daniel, then you'll get in shape. And by the way, it, it's a better diet than when I eat. <laughs> so I'm not, a, I'm not talking against that, but that's not the point of the story. Because it also goes on to say how Daniel and his, his, uh, um, his friends, his Jewish friends, were also more intelligent and more wise, and that wasn't from the diet. This whole thing is about God's faithfulness to his people as they are faithful to him. Later on, uh, three of those friends who also uh, went through this kind of program, right? the king said, you got to bow down to the statue, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to. You probably remember this, right? And the king brings them in and says, listen, I'm the man in charge. You either bow down or you burn in the fiery furnace. And they refuse. They throw the three in. And all of a sudden, they see not three in the fire, but four in the furnace. And that's when uh, uh, the king has them come out and says, their God is the God. And then you remember uh, Daniel in the lion's den, right? This all happens around this time while he's in captivity. And then the last part of of Daniel is actually visions of the future. And it's future history uh, hundreds and hundreds of years uh, in the making. And it's interesting how it completely lines up with actual history. Also during this time, Esther was written, the book of Esther, which is about a story of just a regular, everyday, young Jewish girl, a young Israelite girl, just minding her own business. She gets kind of caught up in this whole kind of beauty pageant for the king. He's looking for a new queen, and she gets caught up in it, and she gets chosen, and she becomes Queen Esther and the stories about how um, God raised her up in that position so that he can preserve his people. All this is about God's faithfulness in the midst of captivity. And then we get to restoration. But it happens in a couple different, or actually a few different ways. The first is God's faithfulness in restoring the temple. Remember, he said, I'm going to restore you. And the first comes with the temple. The temple itself is destroyed around... 586 B.C. A lot of this, uh, at this point from history here on, because it's close enough to what we have, to what we've dug up, this is all history. So that, that secular, I guess you could say, history lines up with what the Bible uh, is saying at this point. But before I talk about God's faithfulness in restoring the temple, I actually, if you would, want to back the truck up uh, years and years and years and years before. 80 years actually uh, around before the temple itself was even destroyed. You remember last year, or last year, last week, uh, we went through all the kings and the, and the different prophets. And you remember there's a one of the predominant prophets is Isaiah. He wrote, he wrote like five, six, seven, eight kings before the very end. And this is what Isaiah writes in chapter 44 of what God told him to do. In verse 24, it says this. This is what the Lord says. So Isaiah is writing on behalf of the Lord. Um, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord, who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. And then he keeps, and then he keeps bragging. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And then verse 28, I, the Lord, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and I will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and the temple, let its foundations be laid. Now, Remember, this is about 80 years before Jerusalem falls and before the temple is destroyed. Isaiah is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple before it even happens. The other thing he does is he mentions a name here of someone that God's going to use. His name is Cyrus. Okay? Now... We want to fast forward about 150 years from Isaiah. You following me? That's a long time. And another guy comes along and he writes his experience. And this is what Ezra writes. And by the way, this is history. You can look up the people involved here. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a real historical person. First, you guys realize what just happened, right? Cyrus is king 150 years later. His name was mentioned 150 years before by a prophet. 
In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, Jeremiah is the one who said, in 70 years I'm going to restore. Right? That's what he's talking about. So just so for historical context, if you don't remember your history, Babylon had its day, Nebuchadnezzar and, and some others. And then Cyrus, king of Persia, came and obliterated Babylon. And everything that belonged to Babylon now belonged to the Persian Empire. So the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. By the way, again, this is historical. He did this, actually he did this for several peoples that they had conquered, where he allowed them to kind of practice the religion that they were no longer allowed to practice. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to rebuild a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, uh, among his kingdom now in Babylon, may his God be with him and let him go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, specifically the temple, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So he says, anyone who's around that wants to be part of this, you can, you can actually donate to these folks. Gold and silver and animals. Verse 5, Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Notice this, verse 6, this is God's hand. All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Can you imagine your neighbor saying, hey, we're going to move back to such and such place. And you're like, you know what? We got some fine china. Take this with you. We got an extra car. Take that as well. And this has happened all around. Moreover, King Cyrus himself, the king, brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and in place of the temple of his God. He had taken the things that were in Jerusalem in the temple and put it in the false god's temple. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. So he himself makes sure that the articles that they took out of the temple went back. And then, and then all these neighbors began to give them stuff. And so they go back and they begin the long thing of building, rebuilding the temple. They start with the altar of God. They do that. And they begin to lay the foundation itself, the temple, because you can't build up until you take care of the foundation. And when they're done uh, building the foundation, something interesting happens. On the day that they're done, everybody's looking at their work. And, and all the young and those who vaguely remember you know, it before, they're rejoicing because that, that's like the hardest thing is the, is the foundation. They're rejoicing. But anyone who remembered the temple and its glory before was weeping. It says that there's so much rejoicing and so much weeping, you couldn't even tell them apart. As they, as they, as they kind of see what's going on. Now right here, a challenge arises to the restoration of the temple. Even though God said, this is what I'm going to do, and he already arranges for his people to come back, a challenge arises. And if you can imagine, there's pagan nations all around them, around Jerusalem, in this uh, area. And they see these, all these newcomers show up, and they get a little nervous. And at first they say, hey, you know what? Maybe this is just like our gods. We'll come help you build the temple. And they're like, no, 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 no. This is the God, and we will rebuild it. We don't want your help. And this begins to get them worried, right? That, that, that maybe they're going to kind of tilt the uh, balance of power. And so they get nervous and they try to dissuade them and they can't do that. So they finally write a letter to a, a king at this point who's other than Cyrus. And they say, hey, you know what? I don't know if you know this, king, but these uh, Israelites have come back and they're building a temple to their God. And I, you may not, you might have a short memory, but we've lived here a while the last time these folks had their temple, they refused to do anything that Babylon said, and, and they rebelled against Babylon. And so the king gets his letter, letter and, he, and he asks his folks, all right, hey, would you go check out if this is true? And they look back and, at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, and they go like, 
That's exactly what happened. All these last kings, the, the, the reason we destroyed that is because they were a pain in the neck. And so they send word and they say, make them stop. They need to stop building this temple. And it does, completely stops for 18 years. The foundation is laid, but that's it. For 18 years, it just sits there. Finally, 18 years later, God sends his prophets, people to speak on his behalf, Haggai and Zechariah, to motivate the people. And this is what it says in Haggai chapter 1. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? In other words, I, I notice you didn't stop building your own homes. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Think about this. You have planted much. Think about all these years. You have planted much, but you've harvested little. Did all the best you know, farming practices out there, but not much food. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. What he's saying is, you're doing everything you can. You're following all the, this is how you grow, you know, your IRA account. This is how to be successful. You're, you know, this is rich dad, poor dad. You read the book and you're applying all the principles, but nothing's happening. You live in the Silicon Valley and it's like a, a bucket with a hole. The more water you pour in it, it just goes away. And Haggai's answer is, that's because you're not, You've got your priorities out of whack. And along comes, same time, the prophet Zechariah basically says the same thing. At the same time, Haggai is. He adds his voice to Haggai that the people should rebuild. Interesting enough, Zechariah's book is not only filled with this exhortation, but it's filled with several visions which focus not just on the now, but more importantly, the future of the Jewish people and even history's end itself. It's kind of like they foresee this is just a season, but unfortunately, even this season of restoration won't last for very long. And at the encouragement of Haggai and Zechariah, they indeed continue to work on the temple. And then, of course, those enemies who initially got them to stop see this going on. And they're like, what? We're going to tell on you, na 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 And the Israelites were like, listen, Cyrus told us that we needed to come back and do this. So we're going to continue rebuilding no matter what. And so they do the same thing. They send a, a letter to the king and say, hey, I don't know if you know this, but they started rebuilding again. Remember the troublemakers they are? They're, they're spreading this rumor about Cyrus saying this, that, and the other thing. And the king goes, Cyrus, okay, let me check that out. And so he tells his people, go back and read you know, the notes of the king's time when Cyrus was here. And sure enough, he comes across Cyrus's order, which says, let them rebuild, encourage them to rebuild. They need to rebuild. And so the king sends word back to these troublemakers and says, hey, you need to not only let them rebuild, but you need to give them gold and silver and animals so that they can rebuild and then they can worship their God. God's faithfulness. In chapter 6, then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. They finished it. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 male lambs, and as a sin offering for all of Israel. Notice they're still dealing with that issue. 12 male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem, according to what is written in the book of Moses. That's the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures. The temple, and you can look up the history on this, is completed around 586, or I'm sorry, in 516 B.C. Now, if you remember, it was destroyed in 586. It was finished, its rebuilding, including an 18-year gap, in 516. And those of you engineers already know that's 70 years. Didn't Jeremiah say something about 70 years? Now, even though the temple is rebuilt, there's still disarray. The, the walls of the city itself, the city itself is still kind of in ruins. And, and now we see the second wave of God's faithfulness in restoring the walls of Jerusalem. In Nehemiah, it says this, The words of Nehemiah, son of 
Hakaliah in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. In other words, what's going back on? I heard, you know, the temple and all this. What's going on? And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. For the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. There's no protection. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. He was moved. His heart broke for his people and for the reputation of his God. And this, this kind of story goes on as Nehemiah actually works uh, for and serves the king. And the king notices he's sad and says, hey, what's going on? And he says, I'm sad because of what's happening at home. And the king says to him, well, then what can I do? And, and Nehemiah wisely says, I'll get back to you. Let me go pray about this. So he asks God, and then he comes back to the king and says, if it's all right with you, I'd like to go help rebuild the walls. And if it's all right with you, could you write me letters, write letters to these folks to provide trees and these folks to provide this and these folks? He had it all planned out, what he needed. And God, of course, showed graciousness, and the king allowed Nehemiah to do this. And he, he goes back and he walks, before he talks to anybody, he walks around the walls and sees what needs to be done. And then he addresses the people, and then he, he makes sure that... Uh, Everyone had responsible for the wall that was near their house. Because he knew they'd work really hard if their house was right there. If you ever want to learn about leadership, Nehemiah is a great book to kind of lay out some leadership principles. But even in the midst of this, you would say, oh, God's restoring it. But no, even in the midst of this, there's a challenge that arises. So the restoration of the wall. Because once again, the enemies around uh, don't like this. And I don't know if they learned their lesson about writing to the king before, but they don't write to the king this time. This time they, they send spies and they try to threaten and they try to kind of awaken the people. And all on the way, God kind of shows Nehemiah how to thwart these as they kind of come up. And it, at one point, he, he splits the workers and half the workers are on guard while the other half are working. It actually says even the half that are working work with a trowel in one hand in order to build the wall and a sword in the other. Just in case someone attacked, they will all rush this battle plan. But as the enemy keeps thinking and looking for weaknesses, they never find a weakness by God's grace. And so in Nehemiah chapter 6, it says this, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. I mean, this is centuries ago. Caltrans couldn't even do this. In today's modern technology, you're taking 52 days just to do the study alone. Yeah. Verse 16, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and they lost their confidence. Notice why. Because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. It was clear, oh my goodness, that could not have gotten done if their God wasn't for them, which is clear under whose strength they were doing it. So God's faithful in building the temple. He's faithful in building walls, but he doesn't stop there. God's faithful in restoring the people. Not just the structure, but the people. It's not enough just to get a job again. It's not, it's not enough just to have your family come back around the dinner table or whatever restoration you're hoping for. The work needs to be done in us. And we kind of see three different ways that God does this. The first is in Nehemiah chapter 8. Verse 2 says this, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, remember he's the priest that was there that got the temple built. He's still there. Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. As he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of, of the law. That's the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures. They listen to it. That's the first step is to know God's Word. That's why, we, that's why we come together and I do so much Scripture. That's why we do Bible studies in small, small groups. We encourage you just daily look, go to God's Word because that is the first step is knowing what God says. But it doesn't stop there. The second step, chapter 9, says in this, in all that has happened to us, the people reflecting, in all that has happened to us, God, you have been just. You have acted faithfully while we did wrong. They see this in the scriptures. 
Our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our fathers did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the warnings you gave them, even while they were in their kingdom enjoying your great goodness to them. In the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. When you hear God's word, the, the, the second step, the initial response and restoration is repentance. Repentance because overall you see that mankind, that, that, that people, maybe your, your parents and your family or just the, the world you live in, we fall short. And then self-confession of my own sins and where I fall short. And the third step is found in the next chapter, of Nehemiah chapter 10, in people's commitment. It says, All these now join their brothers, the nobles, the people at large, and bound themselves with a curse and an oath, what? To follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord, our Lord. The third step was to commit to walk with God in obedience to his word. It's great to come in and say, oh, man, I, I got God's word and I feel really bad because I don't measure up. But it's another thing entirely to say, you know what? Monday through Saturday, I'm going to try my best to live what God showed me. I confess and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey and I'm going to follow my Lord. And that's part of God's restoration of our lives. And that's where I kind of want to focusing in these last few minutes, is God's faithfulness in restoring us. In restoring you and I. Now, I don't know if you've kind of noticed, but a pattern kind of emerges here. It starts with um, in captivity. And, and for us, the captivity may be an economic situation. It may be a broken relationship. It, it may be captivity to a a drug or food or romance or fantasy or whatever. I don't know what it is. But if we stop and look close enough, even while it's at its worst and has its biggest grasp on us, God's hand can be seen in it, his faithfulness, how he brings things together. And then somewhere along the line, there's an initial call to return that he is going to restore us. And we begin to move in that direction. Maybe we begin to go to church or we begin to get involved in a 12-step program or we say sorry to someone. I don't know what it is, but we begin to move in that direction. But what we see in the pattern is between the initial call to return and restoration, we see there's a challenge to the person's faith. You see that. In between the call and restoration, there's a challenge to the faith. And then there's restoration. And part of the pattern that we see after restoration is, is this huge celebration of God's faithfulness. For instance, when they completed the temple, this is what they did in Ezra, recorded in Ezra chapter 6, verse 19. It says, on the 14th day of the first month, the exiles, what, celebrated the Passover. The priests and the Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their brothers and the priests and for themselves. This is something they had neglected to do leading up to exile. So the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of the Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's Passover, because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. They celebrated. They remember what they did celebrate it is, is they're in, their, in this moment, they're going, you know, we should have known all along we would get to this moment. Why? Because we look back to when God initially made us of his people. He initially called us to himself and he showed his hand over the Egyptians in that last plague in particular, the Passover, where he was so faithful to his people. And they celebrated and they remembered their own current restoration and release from, if you would, captivity. But before, remember, before the celebration, and before celebration, there's a challenge. And I want to talk about the challenge of our own restoration. The challenges that we find ourselves in. Because I find that's, that's very true of our own lives, that between God saying, I'm going to bring you out of this, 
to where he actually brings us out of this, there's usually a challenge before our restoration. And as I was contemplating this, one of the things that came to mind is a current book that um, I'm rereading. It's, it's uh, one of my uh, favorites and, and another one of my brothers. He loves the book too, and so I'm kind of rereading it. It's written by Hannah Hernard. It's an allegory of the Christian walk. And the central figure is a gal by the name of Much Afraid, and she wants to go to the high places with the shepherd. The shepherd's Jesus. And the high places is a place of restoration, of, of, of freedom. She's got kind of like, if you would, club feet, and he's, she's hoping that she'll get him to a, her to a place where she can actually walk well and dance. And, and so he says that he will take her on this journey, and, and they begin this journey together, and it, it's tough. But when it really gets tough is when he all of a sudden turns and he hands her off to two companions who are unexpected, and they go the opposite direction of the high places. And they end up in this, in this deserted place. There's just this great lake on one side and just like sand as far as the eye can see on the other and a few scraggly bushes. And it's completely opposite of where the shepherd was going to take her. And at this moment, on her way to the high places, her enemies show up, just like they did at the temple, building of the temple, the building of the wall. Let me just read a passage out of this from Hind's Feet on High Places. Chapter 7. The first enemy, pride. I told you so. Pride would shout viciously, Where are you now, you little fool? Up on the high places? Not much. Do you know that everyone in the Valley of Humiliation knows about this and is laughing at you? Seeking your heart's desire, eh? And left abandoned by him, just as I warned you, on the shores of loneliness. Why didn't you listen to me, you little fool? Then resentment would raise his head over another rock. You know, much afraid, you act like a blind idiot. Who is this shepherd you follow? What sort of person is he to demand everything you have and take everything you offer and give nothing in return but suffering and sorrow and ridicule and shame? Why do you let him treat you like this? Stand up for yourself and demand that he fulfill his promise and take you at once to the high place. If not, tell him that you feel absolved from all necessity to follow him any longer. Bitterness would then break in with his sneering voice. Ah, you know, the more you yield to him, the more he'll demand from you. He is cruel to you and takes advantage of your devotion. All he has demanded from you so far is nothing to what he will demand if you persist in following him. Sooner or later, he'll put you on a cross of some sort and he'll abandon you to it. Self-pity would chime in next. And in some dreadful way, he was almost worse than any of the others. Poor little much afraid, he would whisper. It's too bad, you know. You really are so devoted and you've refused him nothing absolutely nothing yet this is the cruel way in which he treats you can you really believe when he acts towards you like this that he loves you and he has your real good at heart how can that be possible you have every right to feel sorry for yourself even if you're perfectly willing to suffer for his sake at least other people ought to know about it and pity you instead of misunderstanding and ridiculing you as they do. It really seems as though the one you follow takes delight in making you suffer and leaving you to be misunderstood. For every time you yield to him, he thinks of some new way of wounding and bruising you. You can imagine the effect that this has. I'm much afraid. The truth is, in my life, don't know about yours, these enemies exist. 
I have pride. He's located somewhere right here. He likes to stick his head up all the time and say, man, you deserve better than this. You're the pastor, for goodness sake. Resentment. It's kind of the pit in my stomach. Kind of rises up. For all you do, this is what you get. Bitterness. Bitterness seems to reside just right here in the back, kind of whispering, right? It's just hard to let go of some things. I remember when, I remember when, I deserve better than. And then self-pity. Oh, my, my companion, self-pity. Woe is me. And they usually rear their heads when God has said, man, I want to do this thing. And it seems like the thing that he wants to do, my life, my family, my church, my job, my whatever image of myself is going in the opposite direction. And they stick up their heads and they go, (laughs) told you so. Poor you. God is so lucky to have you. How could he treat you this way? And God does this, I believe, so that we learn to combat the lies and the deception. This is why he does this for Much Afraid. He doesn't just want to take her to high places. He wants her to take her to a place where she truly has freedom. So when the enemies raise their heads, she's no longer afraid of them. Their lies no longer matter. Even though life may still be tough. As the worship team comes up, I want to encourage us to celebrate God's faithfulness and remember his faithfulness in the past, in the present, and what is to come. This is exactly what Jesus did for his disciples. He gave us something to hold on to, just like the people of Israel. In Matthew chapter 26, they're celebrating the Passover, just like they had done centuries before when the temple was restored. They're celebrating the Passover. And in the middle of this, Jesus grabs the bread. In verse 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, the dry, unleavened bread, gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. Take, eat, he said, for this is my body. Remember the brokenness of the body. My body will be broken for you. Then he took the cup, and remember we talked about this. This is literally known as the cup of redemption. Gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many. Why? Why? For the forgiveness of sins, it's our restoration. And so this morning, uh, we're going to sing a couple songs. And during it, I invite you, as the Holy Spirit moves you, to come forward and to take the bread. Take the cup that we call, often referred to as communion. But I don't want you just to take them ceremonially because, you know, we're in church and it's communion time. What I want you to do is I want you to reflect on your own restoration. I don't know where you are in, in, the, in the process. Maybe you feel like you're in the midst of captivity you don't, and you're just discombobulated. You, maybe you don't even see God's faithfulness. Maybe you need to just stop and realize even in the midst of this, he's faithful. Maybe, maybe you're in the midst of the initial call. There's hope, but no answer yet. Maybe you're in the midst of the challenge to your faith. You don't see it moving anywhere. And you've tried and you've laid it down and you tried and you laid it down. You tried and you laid it down and the enemies are whispering, are you going to trust him? Maybe God, by his grace, you're in a a period where he has restored you. No matter what it is, I invite you to come forward and celebrate God's faithfulness. The past faithfulness of the Christ who laid his life down for you. You want to know how much God cares for you? You want to know how much the shepherd thinks of you? He left the glory of heaven, the wonderful high places, and roamed the valley in humility and love, only to be rewarded by nails on a cross. But he did it for you, for me. 
remember the present, that because of that, we now stand in grace with God, not because we finally got it together. We finally fulfill the oath that we've never been able to fulfill before. No, we have peace with God. Why? Because of what Christ did on our behalf. And then we're trying with all we can to follow that. And the future, remember the future that God will restore you, both in the now as well as in eternity unto himself. When you take this cup, when you take this bread, may it be a reminder of the beloved his love for you.